welcome at the lecture development of electronic music in the Netherlands. And we'll be hosting a talk with Kees Staslaar. He is a, a composer and teacher of at the Institute of Sonology and since 2006 head of the Institute of Sonology and also author of uh, On the Threshold of Beauty, uh, a book about the history of electronic music in the Netherlands. And we have also Laura Agnes Dei, an Itali Italian musician, saxophone player, and she is an electroacoustic composer as well. She was supposed to be in the program this year, and now she is just here in this talk with Case and me, uh, all the way from Italy. And um, it Hi feels. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. <Hello>. Yes. <laughs> um, we had a, a introductory talk a few years, a few weeks ago, um, and now it feels uh, strange to start again with uh, all these lights on me. But um, uh, let's talk about the history of electronic music and how uh, Gaudiamus and the history of Gaudiamus is uh, connected to this. So I thought maybe uh, Case could. Uh, start off with something about uh, the history of electronic music in the Netherlands and how Gaudiamus was connected to that. Yes, of course, <clears throat> I can do that. Um, there was some electronic music or to be more precise, some radiophonic music with uh, electronic elements in it composed between 1952 and 1956 at uh, a radio uh, in the Netherlands but there wasn't a real studio for electronic music. So when these pieces were composed or produced, um, pieces like Orestes by Henk Badings or Job by uh, uh, Tom de Leeuw, some additional equipment was brought into a studio and uh, then the piece was produced and then after that, that studio would be uh, an ordinary radio studio again. And it was indeed uh, Gaudiamus or uh, Walter Maas who uh, understood that electronic music was an important development uh, within contemporary music, for which Gaudiamus was already uh, the main promoter in the Netherlands since 1945. And he thought, okay, if we want to get something like that started here, we need a studio where composers can uh, uh, have experiences, where they can uh, uh, compose and where they can be uh, educated. Uh, in the use of this uh, technology. And he had several uh, attempts, several discussions uh, at the radio, at Philips. Um, he wasn't very successful. Uh, then in 1956, there was indeed a studio established in, at Philips Research Laboratories in Eindhoven, but this was um, originally intended as a temporary studio just uh, to give Hank Badings the opportunity to compose some electronic ballet music for the Holland Festival. Uh, and around that time, uh, Walter Maas then managed to uh, establish uh, the Contact Organ Electronic Electronic Music, so the Contact Organization for Electronic Music. And this was uh, just an organization at first uh, with a main goal uh, to establish a studio where composers could uh, be educated and work. And this studio then was in, in, uh, established in Delft in 1957 in September. So that was a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of years. Um, so mostly uh, the development of uh, getting an actual studio in the Netherlands was the base of the start of electronic music development in the Netherlands. Yes, I mean that is of course uh, uh, true uh, everywhere because at those, in those years uh, no one could afford uh, uh, setting up a studio with that kind of equipment uh, privately. So you needed an institution where something like that would be started. And uh, of course in Germany and in France and in Italy the, 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 the obvious places to do this were radio stations. Uh, and in the Netherlands the first studio was at Philips Research Laboratories. And then one year later, uh, one and a half year later, came uh, the studio at the uh, TH Delft, where uh, uh, Gaudiamus or Contactor Gaan Electronic Music managed to get all the composers in to be educated and to, uh, to be able to try out uh, this new uh, medium. And 
and although I asked now about uh, the technological start, um, two weeks ago you mentioned you actually uh, should not talk about electronic music by talking about all the technical aspects, but what it means musically, which is also maybe a question where uh, Laura come, can come in. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, you said this, obviously, because you think the conversation about electronic music is often only about uh, technological developments and not about what it means musically. Yes, well, I would... Uh... You know, I, I could say it a little bit stronger even. I think that the term electronic music is completely useless. <laughs> Great. Uh, because it doesn't describe anything, you know, it, it, it try, especially now. I mean, when the, when the term was introduced in, 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 in the 50s, uh, basically in Germany, the Electronische Musik, then it was uh, making a very clear reference to not only the use of technology, but also to a very strong uh, attitude towards composing. And now, uh, basically, everything that uses technology is called electronic music, whereas the music itself, uh, I mean, it's such a broad field, you know, that it, it's, it's, so that's, that's, that's what I mean by saying that. Yeah, I think we, we can uh, uh, describe this uh, kind of music that we are uh, trying to define as um, a new sensibility uh, uh, towards sounds. Basically, um, that's why maybe sometimes using the term experimental is, uh, is more effective uh, because um, at certain point in the history of music, uh, the, the focus uh, shifted from uh, um, tonality, from uh, uh, basically a, a pitched oriented uh, um, kind of composition and it started uh, um, it started a, a, an attitude that was more looking into uh, the sound itself, so uh, into the timbre component of it, for example. So in this sense, when often uh, we, we talk about electronic music, but uh, it's, it's very reductive because uh, it's, uh, it's more about uh, um, the different uh, of um, composing the sound itself and not composing with sounds and if we intend composing with sounds as a composing with notes, basically. This, of course, is a very, very, very general uh, discourse, but just to simplifying. And how do you... Uh, maybe it's also good to mention that Laura went to the Institute of Sonology, so she has, she knows case as well. And um, she knows about... So she knows how much, much Case knows about the history of sonology and electronic music in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, how do you, uh, do you feel that your base in the Netherlands helped you develop your uh, own music currently? Oh, yeah, for me it was a um, uh, uh, game changer, <laughs> we, we can see going uh, to uh, studying at sonology and uh, because my background is um, as a, a classical music student uh, not I would say not like a classical only classical music musician because I was uh, interested um, even before going to the Netherlands uh, um, interested in uh, free improvisation or like uh, yeah and I was playing like in experimental rock band and so on, but um, yeah, what what I could uh, explore more, and um, I could find a, an environment where my interest uh, in sounds itself. So uh, even I, if I'm uh, an instrumentalist, so I play the saxophone, but I was more uh, um, into exploring uh, the timbral possibility of my instruments, for example, then improving my skills uh, as. Um, um, as a performer of like a repertoire, uh, like a, a historical repertoire, for example. And uh, yes, and what we can find uh, in sonology, but uh, also in uh, other music uh, program in the Netherlands, I suppose, is uh, this uh, study that um, are oriented to the full spectrum of possibilities that you have uh, when you work with, uh, with sounds. That's 
where the name Sonology come from. Uh, so yeah, we are back uh, on what uh, I was saying before. Um, and yeah, so what, what's specific to the Netherlands, I think is the possibility to have like a, um, a lot of equipment that is uh, in the school and this equipment is for spatial music. So for example, in The Hague, there is also like a wave field uh, system. Um, and there are there are studios available, and all these, for example, in my uh, in my country is is very limited, and and in the Netherlands it's very accessible, and not only in Sonology, but uh, for example at Worm Studio or in BLMT Studios. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's about facilities, uh, but uh, also about the open-minded way uh, in which you can choose uh, a, a topic and develop that topic, even uh, if uh, is uh, is not that uh, academic, or even if it's not uh, uh, in a um, in a curriculum that is uh, fixed. I would say. So you had a lot. Uh... You learned a lot at Sonology, but also you mentioned that the that is for de decades now in the Netherlands we host these uh, electronic music studios, and uh, we kept them alive at institutes as Sonol uh, like Sonology and Warm, mm -hmm. and uh, this means we have a, a culture where. Uh, we created a culture where these studios still have a function while currently, of course, they're not necessary anymore. Yeah, we, we can say, and in this also case, maybe uh, can join us, uh, that the, the role of the studio itself, uh, it, it changed a lot with, uh, uh, with the use and uh, the very fast development of, uh, the, um, of laptop uh, technologies. So uh, it's uh, now all the equipment is more affordable and uh, is more also portable. Um, but as I was saying, like uh, uh, if we talk about electronic music and uh, like working with technologies, uh, we are talking about a very, very broad uh, kind of uh, um, possibilities. So it all depends on what you are searching for as a composer and as a musician. So uh, for certain kind of technology is still uh, um, uh, it's still uh, necessary to go to a, a specific place. Well, it is of course true that the computer is a very powerful tool to uh, make electronic uh, sounds, to process uh, sounds from acoustic instruments. But uh, that's something else than a studio, of course, because a studio has good uh, acoustics. A studio usually has, uh, well, it's certainly at Sonology, we, every studio has a multi-channel loudspeaker system so that uh, music can be produced uh, spatially as well, uh, but more importantly, a studio is a place where people can meet, you know, where you can invite a fellow student or a teacher or a friend and say, hey, you know, I'm making this, come and listen, what do you think about it? And uh, this then also feeds back to a term that uh, Laura was mentioning when she said, uh, well, maybe experimental music is, is a better word. Uh, it's of course true, electronic music should be experimental, but unfortunately, 90% uh, of the time it is not. Um, and I think if you say experiment, uh, it means also that you have to set, uh, define a context first in which the experiment takes place, because otherwise the experiment is useless. If you, if you decide what your criteria are for your experiment, then you have something uh, by which you can assess the results and discuss them with your peers. And that is, I think, what, what, what the importance of a studio and a community and an educational program is uh, uh, these days. So that you have the context and not only sort of play around uh, making, the, making sounds that are available, but actually working from a concept and exactly. trying to... Do you feel it's the same, Laura, if you compose? Or? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. It's also about having a community uh, to, for sharing your work, to uh, developing new ideas and trying out. So these communities are, of course, not only uh, um, in, inside institutions, 
but there are also a lot of like community that uh, gather around uh, you know occupied place uh, or do do it, do it yourself venue the studio of a specific uh, musician and so on uh, so in this sense if we if if we talk about an entire country, we, of course, uh, we mention the institutional place, but we know that uh, it's a very broad um, kind of places where music uh, is made. And uh, specific to the Netherlands for me is the, the fact that this community is very, very international. And uh, and it's uh, well is very welcoming uh, with uh, people from other countries, and um, and this is very special because uh, and it's possible also uh, because uh, Dutch people are basically bilingual, so you can uh, you can speak English, you can study in English, you can interact uh, very easily in English, and. Yeah, so I think this is uh, also a very important uh, point in uh, in the in the Dutch scene. And maybe that's also part of the Institute of Sonology and maybe Gaudiam is both who are broadcasting into the world that everyone should come here, right? To I think you can already see that in the first uh, uh, initiatives of the contactorgaan in the, in the end of the 50s, uh, so by Walter Maas, that, uh, I mean, for him, it was from the very first moment, it was an international uh, affair. He was inviting uh, representatives from the uh, German uh, school. So Stockhausen came, Koenig came, uh, Werner Meyer Epler came. Uh, he invited people from France to talk about musique concrète. He, he, had a, had a, he had a whole a huge network. And you see it also when you look at the participants of this course that took place in uh, the garden house at, uh, at Gaudiamus, the electronic music course from 62 until 66, that uh, th these people came from everywhere. And they stayed in the Netherlands for, for nine months or so to attend these, uh, this course. So it was international from the start. And I think we... we we owe uh, uh, Walter Maas something for that. And um, do you think, uh, like you say, this practice of international uh, international uh, people coming together and this practice of keeping the studios alive to have these institutionalized centers of music um, kept being the same in a way? How did the... Um, uh, way of interaction between the the instrument and the and the artist changed over the years is this a question for me or for no, i think you could you should start it maybe <laughs> yeah. well uh i mean you should i mean for me it's still a question uh if if a studio uh with analog equipment or a computer is an instrument yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tool, of course, but an instrument in the way that you could call a saxophone or a violin an instrument, um, that's, that's uh, questionable uh, in the sense that uh, um, um, there, yeah, the whole way in which you communicate and, and uh, interact with, with a device like a, like a computer has to do, of course, is, is much less physical than the way that you interact with a, with a real musical instrument. Uh, and the way that you can practice, for instance, playing on a computer is, is very different from uh, practicing a musical instrument. So, I mean, I know many people say, claim that these devices are instruments just as the other musical instruments are, but I'm, I have my doubts there. But maybe Laura can say something. Yeah, what, what I found uh, in the Netherlands is that um, there is a lot of research uh, in uh, the way an electronic instrument can be performable somehow. And uh, I think this uh, is, is peculiar to the, to the Netherlands. And of course, this re research exists somewhere else. But uh, I think in place like uh, STEIM, this uh, is a very a core point uh, of, uh, of the way uh, in which they are looking at technology. And um, I connect this also to the fact that uh, um, the Netherlands uh, um, has a very interesting uh, impro improvised music scene. 
And, and so uh, I really like how uh, it's, um, it's very common that uh, uh, traditional instruments are, uh, are used together with electronic instruments. And uh, there is um, uh, a lot of um, projects that are involving this, uh, this combination. And, uh, uh, um, and maybe also going back to, to the question of like internationality and maybe cases can also say something more about it. It's, uh, it's also because um, well, I think the Netherlands uh, uh, doesn't have uh, um, a very uh, um, uh, strict history like uh, Germany or France, for example, where like uh, there was a predominant like um, school of electronic music. Uh, I, so what I'm trying to say is that like, I think the Netherlands are very like a, um, a mixture of like different um, influences and a, a different approach of uh, to sound making. And uh, this approach can coexist uh, in a very natural way. And, um, and this is very interesting. So yeah, performability, I think it's a core point uh, of uh, the experimental music uh, in the Netherlands. Yes, I thought I was asking a very uh, simple question about how it started out as something where you had to know about sort of uh, programming computer and writing patches and maybe not even being able to uh, uh, make get the work you composed into existence yourself because you needed a technician to to work the computers um but case is look already looking a bit that it might be a different way so but you, you were talking right about the start of electronic music as something you could not do yourself if you're not sort of knowledgeable at, about these computers well, we we discussed that in the in the preliminary talk that we had indeed that uh, well not only with computers but already before that you know with the large analog studio you had in the, in the Cologne radio or the studio that you had in Paris with uh, Pierre Schaeffer that many uh, people who went there to compose something or very often they had already composed something so they they had a plan for something and this was then either realized completely by a technician of the studio or it was uh, uh, realized in uh, collaboration with a technician in one of those studios. And it was quite uh, an exception that composers were able to work uh, in, in, a, in a studio like that uh, completely on their own. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, comp the composers who uh, had the uh, the time and the energy to make the first attempts to to make sounds or musical structures with computers. I mean, there were very few of them uh, uh, globally because it was such hard work. You know? and, uh, and of course, nowadays um, uh, it's much easier. But there is also a danger in in the fact that this has become much easier because you know you are overwhelmed with sound possibilities when you buy a synthesizer or when you buy a computer program uh, uh, for, for, for music production. And uh, before you know it, you, you think you are doing something original, but you're just falling into, a, you're stepping into um, uh, yeah, presets and uh, you're making things that are actually uh, handed to you by, by other people. And that's, uh, that's tricky. But I think Laura, probably enjoys the fact that she has her own agency in using or creating the sounds um, more than would have been in the past, maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, very, uh, yeah, it's, as we were saying, it's not about tools, not only about tools. So it's also about, uh, it's, it's much about ideas. Uh, so, yeah, in this sense, I don't think that, uh, um, or we can better say that uh, an instrument can be limiting somehow, no, it can be, because of course, like every instrument uh, is, uh, it's, it's a design, it's not, a, it's, a, um, 
he has in itself a designed way of like um, uh, making music. So if an instrument is designed in, in a specific way, uh, it, it somehow under, um, uh, contains in itself a way of thinking about music. So for example, if I, um, I use uh, an instrument that is, has like uh, the possibility of like doing scales, uh, with the with notes with the, uh, so it's a more a pitched oriented instrument so um, of course uh, uh, maybe it will lead you to um, or it's it's supposed to be used in a uh, in a kind of music where uh, uh, pitch pitch are the core aspect no but I mean I I'm a saxophone player so I of course. I know that, for example, my instrument that is the last acoustic instrument invented for the symphonic orchestra that entered the symphonic orchestra, no, is in itself a, a piece of engineering that contains so much like uh, uh, sound possibilities. So uh, again, what we are talking about is a new way of looking at uh, sound making. So but that's very good that you mentioned this, Laura, because uh, this was actually for the uh, composers in the uh, electronic music studio in Cologne, the main reason to start composing electronic music, because they saw, so you have to look at a kind of compositional um, tradition that was developed in the, since the Second World War, which is called serial music. Yes, And in serial music, the composers try to um, implement uh, Schoenberg's idea of uh, 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 series, of tone series, also into the other musical dimensions, so dynamics, uh, durations, uh, uh, etc. But then they arrived at the point where actually these musical instruments that they were writing for had this history, this, this, this technology that you know, pushed them into certain musical behaviors. And in order to get away from that, they needed to make those sounds themselves with electronic means and this is where this why this electronic music that was made in cologne in the in the in the 50s has such a strong theoretical background also because it comes from a very strong desire to get away from this uh, uh, traditional instrumental music and which is interesting of course for laura who is not who is now making electronic music in combination with the use of her saxophone, right? She's not, you're not leaving the, the traditional instruments behind. You're expanding the range of possible sounds surrounding the sounds you can make with the saxophone. Yeah, exactly. My research at the Institute of Sonology uh, was uh, about uh, uh, searching for uh, um, uh, all the timbre possibility in, especially um, in wind instruments and uh, how I could expand these and explore uh, this uh, temporal domain within uh, uh, the electronic music uh, realm somehow. So um, yeah, it's not, uh, um, I don't see of course as these two um, uh, domain as opposite. So it's not about uh, uh, stop using the traditional instruments but uh, is about uh, the possibility of like uh, uh, express new ideas uh, with uh, all the tools that we we have now, and uh, also because I think uh, um, it's very interesting also to take into consideration uh, what uh, uh, the comp composer Lackerman called the aura of the instrument. So, uh, instrument and his sounds as also um, uh, his uh, history. You know, so when we hear, uh, when we are hearing uh, a specific um, uh, a saxophone, for example, we are hearing also the history of saxophone and all the context in which a saxophone um, was uh, used and in which uh, we, our, ourselves, we experience that specific sounds. So there is also a social aspect. And this uh, uh, is the same also with the electronic music instruments. Uh, there are uh, uh, some, um, even not only like in the, in the acad so-called academic world, but uh, there are pieces uh, piece of gear that are very, uh, their sound shaped uh, the history of techno music uh, or um, uh, yeah, or other genres. So there is also this aspect into 
uh, when we are making like new sounds, we also have to take in consideration uh, the this um, this other point of view, in my opinion. Well, don't get me wrong, Dane, that I, I that these composers that I was talking about uh, wanted to uh, get rid of the musical instruments forever. Yeah, it was just that within that particular domain, uh, in order to carry out that experiment, they needed to concentrate on something else and to limit themselves deliberately to find out what those possibilities were and what it would mean to actually um, you know impose compositional rules on sound production but uh, all these composers koenig stockhausen uh, uh, ligeti uh, uh, kagel kept on writing uh, for musical instruments and uh, in, most of the time they have composed uh, more uh, instrumental works than electronic works in their uh, in, the, in their lifetime. Yeah. And it, it is an interesting way of talking about music, uh, talking about the the frame of possibilities, like you said, Laura, with the, with the saxophone that is, of course, scale and tone oriented. And uh, you think you want to have a sort of maybe freer or broader approach to the sounds you can make. Um, once I interviewed someone about modular music and she experienced while she was making modular music that she can could live her life in a modular way, that she mm -hmm. felt more freedom in her in her in her living her life because she was experiencing this freedom in the way she was creating sound. Yeah, what what is uh, specific to saxophone is uh, that uh, is an instrument that um, as um, a timbre that is very closed to the um, to the voice so uh, and um, and it's uh, it's an instrument that uh, has a very uh, um, has a great like a timbral uh, palette as we, we we can say no it's very very flexible uh, in, in timbre in timbre um, and that's why also is uh, is used in a very um, large uh, uh, variety of music, and uh, um, so as the human voice, like uh, uh, every instrumentalist, has his own uh, sound, and is very, um, of course, this is uh, we can say the the same thing for uh, all the kind of instrument. But with uh, with the saxophone, it's very easy to personalize the the. The, your sound uh, so uh, is we can say that freedom is is somehow embedded in the sound of the saxophone and um, so yeah definitely uh, it's uh, we, we can say that it's also about freedom this uh, this approach um. <laughs> it is a uh... I'm. I think when um when we had this uh, our last conversation, it was also way freer than uh, the conversation we're having now, but um, because we did not know what kind of answers we gave him before, um, so it was uh, nice to hear uh, things about uh, also the intuition that we can. Uh, that you find in uh, approaching the music you make and um, or the stories that uh, Case told about uh, actually the the history of his book about how the electronic music started because I feel we have a lot of uh, facts now what we give if we're, if we're talking because we want to in, uh, inform our audience but maybe we can uh, have a, a bit more free conversation. And I also, I, I don't know how many audience members we have, but if there are people who want to ask a question themselves to Case or Laura, they're free to pose a question. Um, well, I mean, something that I remi rem that remem that remember from the previous conversation that, that, that triggered some... Uh, uh, well, ideas from, from all of us was to talk about what it what it, what the word intuition actually means, because uh, intuition is very often associated with freedom as a kind of um, 
you know, as the opposite of uh, something that might be more oriented towards uh, rules or systems or methods. And I think that's actually a very misleading uh, way of looking at it because, first of all, intuition is always based on an experience that you have. Yeah? So without experience, you cannot have any intuition. And at the same time, when you are, same time, when you are planning a piece of music, when you are trying to design something, you cannot do that without in, in, intuition. You know, without intuition, music would be nothing. But at the same time, only basing yourself on previous experiences is uh, a way to repeat yourself. So this is where, where I think it, 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 intuition is a very interesting uh, thing to discuss, but we should not do it in a superficial way. No, um, I think also one of the conclusions last time was that there is that in, intuition is indeed the the main component of uh, actually being a, an artist, while sort of not being led by the the instrument or the components you have in the studio, and the academic academic background or the concept you came came with, but. Um, to, to I mean, if a, sci if a scientist sets up an experiment, then he uses his intuition yeah, because he, he thinks that in a certain direction there might be something to discover. And this is the same in art. Mm. Lara is... Yeah, I'm thinking. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult uh, topic. Um, um, yes. I mean, uh, we coming back, going back to the word experimental, no? And uh, I really, I really like also that uh, case bro, um, uh, said that uh, uh, it's also about experience, no, and context. So um, in this sense, again, it's very important uh, uh, also to have a a, a place and a community, no, to share, and uh, it's also part of the context, no? So, because we, we are here in a lecture that is uh, um, framing the topic also uh, in, uh, into um, the, the Netherlands. So uh, that's also, um, so the freedom of experiment is about having a physical <laughs> Uh, space to do it actually no and um, and also so so yeah i just want to be very practical in this sense no that uh, this kind of music needs uh, uh, time needs uh, facilities need uh, uh, needs a place and in my very personal experience i found that in the netherlands and uh, it's very important that uh, um, all these uh, um, will uh, will be guaranteed also in in the future. And it's very important that uh, um, that we understand the the fact that to have some uh, uh, result, we we need time and we need to invest this uh, this. Uh, um, uh, time and, and money and uh, everything on uh, on it. Uh, intuition. Uh, what what is the role of intuition uh, in this? Uh, uh, of I'm very against the romantic idea that the artists just uh, you know uh, <laughs> have intuition that are there in a like a hyper uranium space uh, uh, place and I think it, it's a very dangerous idea and because uh, uh, again it, uh, it uh, decontextualize uh, art and I'm very against this uh, this fact because art is uh, a human uh, product and um, so in this sense, uh, yeah, intuition goes uh, can go with a very like uh, as Case was saying with a very like um, um, strict way of like uh, experimenting, and uh, we can't have one thing uh, like there. We are again we are not talking about opposite. Uh, our uh, 
like uh, to be methodic, uh, to be uh, conceptual, uh, doesn't exclude to, to be intuitive. And um, I think the case also mentioned it or uh, uh, related to the topic before, but um, he was mentioning that um, being on the forefront of techn technological development, for example, or sort of uh, playing around with these different techniques um, does not uh, always mean that you are experimenting or making experimental music or electronic music in um, because it's yeah you're not making something new or artistic it doesn't have to be new maybe but artistic maybe even um, and do you think case when uh, do you think the sort of being on the forefront of electronic music and the technical developments of music did it, did there uh, evolve some structures or um, certain ways of using electronic uh, devices to make music that was actually pop music or sort of not maybe pop music yet, but didn't wasn't new music anymore. So I don't think I completely understand your question. Um, you were asking when pop music started to use uh, technology or when it was starting to use uh, uh, electronic means? Yeah, now in a way, when the electronic music development sort of on the forefront of the technical technical uh, possibilities, when did there became such structures that it was uh, obvious that you could make such electronic music or you could, could make such electronic music and it wasn't sort of the experiment anymore? Well, uh, looking at the, the first electronic music in the Netherlands uh, at Philips, uh, making popular electronic music was uh, done there uh, starting in 1957, seven, and it was indeed an experiment. It was really a research question. Uh, so let's see now that we have this equipment and Badings made his art music with it, whatever you uh, think of that. Uh, let's see if we can use the same equipment also to make uh, popular music. So popular music that would then be made in the studio, uh, put on a, a, a vinyl record and, uh, and released uh, without any um, uh, interpretation in between, without any performers in between. And this was done uh, quite successfully uh, by uh, Dick Reimarkers and Tom Disseveld. Uh, I think of the uh, extended uh, the EP uh, electronic movements, uh, and then later uh, in 1961, they made uh, a piece for jazz orchestra and electronics together called Intersection, and then in 1962-63, Disseveld made an LP called Fantasy in Orbit, uh, and this it, that that is really very interesting stuff because you 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 see. Uh, not only that uh, these people had very interesting artistic ideas, but they had, we were also very inventive in, in, in applying the available technology and with incredible limitations and still making the music that they had, that they had in mind. Um, so the, 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 electronic, the experiments with electronics in popular music were actually uh, there almost from the start. So it's actually where where you look, you find, of, or where the music was made for the first time actually was also the starting point for making music in a, in a popular way, actually. Um, and I think that it was a, that was a question, of course, related uh, between uh, technology and art. And I really wanted to try to get to that topic again because Laura last time said something interesting um, when she when you mentioned that there might be uh, some uh, you said okay this there is this festival in the Netherlands and it's about art and technology and for me that symbolizes the way in the Netherlands we approach art yeah I can give you I mean, I'm Italian, and uh, so um, I found myself uh, thinking 
about uh, how uh, or maybe what culture is uh, in my country and in the Netherlands uh, where I lived for three years. And um, yeah, and I think that uh, in my country we are more um, um, oriented to um, human studies somehow, you know, like uh, so when someone is uh, considered like a um, um, a very well educated person it's also um, a matter of like uh, knowing the, our literature for example no even uh, if uh, it's not your field of work or uh, no and because uh, our history and uh, is um, is very informed uh, by um, yeah, big uh, writers and uh, poets and so on. And when I think about the Netherlands, maybe I'm wrong, of course, <laughs> but uh, that's just my perspective. Uh, I think um, uh, art is often connected with the technologies, uh, maybe uh, because uh, in the history of the country, is, uh, there is, uh, it's, um, it plays a, a significant role also uh, uh, the development of like, uh, um, Technologies for uh, for um, for uh, engineering te technologies because uh, it's in the geography itself of the of the country somehow and um, so yeah that is is just um, an idea I, I I don't know if I have the historical uh, um, knowledge to to say more about that but uh, I notice how in festival uh, as for example. Uh, Sonic Hex or like today's art, uh, there are there are often like uh, presented uh, work that uh, um, somehow like uh, are at uh, the intersection point in between science and uh, and art, uh, or for example uh, some research about like um, sonifying uh, data. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, also like. Um, um, are, yeah, projects that are investigating that, or I think about the uh, art science uh, interfaculty that we have. Uh, uh, that um, it's a um, it's a program uh, in between the, the KBK in uh, the Hague and, and the Sonology department. Um, so, yes, I don't know if Case uh, uh, has more to to say about that. Well, I don't ha have this uh, uh, bird's eye view uh, on the Netherlands because I'm I'm here, uh, and uh, and I've been here always. So, but I find your observation very interesting. But you're of course right that without technology, this country would uh, be underwater. <laughs> it wouldn't exist. <laughs> so. so. Yeah, I I think uh, it's uh, it's just more. Um, uh, yeah, the way that uh, art and science are uh, interconnected is uh, is very fascinating uh, in the Netherlands, and I think that's also maybe uh, I don't know. In my experience, also the audience seems more prepared to uh, to welcome uh, um, uh, the use of technology in in music. You know, maybe because uh, there isn't like a such like a big heavy like past, and uh, there is uh, there isn't like um, a such uh, uh, yeah um, uh, museological. I say, I hope. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a word. No, muse museological way of like looking at culture, but uh, there is. Um, um, there is a way of looking at culture that uh, emphasizes more the here and now. And this, I found it's it's very important for who is trying to uh, to found uh, um, yeah new forms, uh, new musical forms. That's very important because uh, um, that there is an environment that uh, is um, uh, is it's prepared to 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 welcome and to support this um, uh, this kind of art. I I I'm reading also a, um, a book that uh, says uh, that also. Uh, in visual arts uh, in the Netherlands, there was a big uh, support for like abstract uh, 
uh, art. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that like uh, Mondrian is one of your biggest uh, visual artists, and uh, the most celebrated, at least for what I. I but saw. but he wasn't much supported uh, during his lifetime, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, yeah. Um, um, this book is referring more like uh, toward the eighties. So, uh, but uh, in this sense, I think that the country has a tradition, or at least now, uh, yeah, for example, Mondrian is very like uh, celebrated. So uh, at least, uh, um, uh, at least now, um, yeah, I don't know if this parallel can make sense, but um, uh, yeah, I see that, for example, in my country, like uh, the, it's, uh, it's more a struggle to just like, uh, um, to make people understand that music is not just opera, you know, <laughs> and uh, that is important to also look at, at what uh, new, new musical forms are uh, um, are now being de developed and how to support uh, this kind of research. Nevertheless, Italy made a very important contribution to the avant-garde of the 20th century, of course, with uh, Luigi Nono and Luciano Berio, Bruno Maderna, uh, Dalla Piccola, uh, and then also uh, later, uh, I mean, there, there are many uh, famous Italian uh, composers uh, of contemporary music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that we don't have like a history for that. We, we absolutely have. And but uh, again, yeah, for uh, just make make this example, like uh, our equipment that was uh, in the um, Studio di Phonologia in Milan now is in, in our museum. <laughs> and uh, we can if we trace a parallel like uh, what we have in sonology is, uh, is somehow like uh, the, the also historical equipment and we are studying on it. And uh, so something uh, went wrong, apparently, like <laughs> between uh, like uh, the studio of phonology and now. And uh, that's that that's the important. I think that this is very important when a country like uh, see his past uh, also like in a proactive uh, uh, way. No, that we are we are still making music now. So I think we're very glad with your perspective on the Netherlands and <laughs> not thinking that it's just maybe. Uh, Sort of an unromantic way of looking at it might be that we are just uh, have more respect for technology than for art, and then mm. if it's combined, then it's then it might be better. Mm. Um, but actually, we have a question from an audience. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I'll I'll give it to you any anyway. Um, long ago, there were festivals with just tape music. Now most have disappeared or have tape and video. Is there a future for just beautiful sounds? Laura, are you going to answer it or should I start? No, you should start. <laughs> well, it is true that uh, the first concerts for electronic music were um, organized by putting loudspeakers in the concert hall and playing uh, music from uh, tape recorders. So basically the music started with the tape hiss and then came the music. Um, but um, uh, that was just a necessity because uh, there was no uh, way that you could even consider bringing the equipment of the studio on stage. And even if you would do that, you would not hear the music because the music wasn't performed on those instruments, but it was produced on those instruments. So just to make a single sound was uh, um, uh, was a procedure that went through many steps and then finally you had this sound on a tape and when tape sounds had to be combined you had to go through multiple steps multiple tape recorders copying layers and so on until you had your final piece so there was just no other way to play that music in a concert hall than to do it like that we should also not forget by the way that the music that was made in cologne and in paris and probably also in italy at first was supposed to be music for the radio so it wasn't even meant to be performed in a concert hall but of course people started to do it right away and then came a very interesting way, uh, idea which was then to spatialize this music so to use loudspeaker systems with loudspeakers surrounding the audience uh, so to to create an experience for the audience in the concert hall that was unique and that could not be compared with listening to this music at home on the radio 
or uh, even on a surround uh, loudspeaker system like people have them at home now. Because there's, of course, a third aspect, which I, I think is at least as important, which is the social aspect, listening to a piece of music together, listening to it, uh, discussing it after the concert. Um, it is true that nowadays a lot of uh, electronic music is also performed live. You see combinations with videos. You see uh, uh, sound installations in, uh, in, in in art galleries with electronic sound. Uh, but the uh, what what is now called fixed media, so music that is just played from a computer, usually with the composer or uh, an, uh, someone else behind the mixing desk, finding an optimal way of playing that music and presenting it to an audience and communicating with that audience, I think is, for me at least, is a very valid way of, uh, of, of music uh, uh, presentation. Do you still have something to add, Laura, about uh, the beautiful sounds in the future or uh, are you, uh, or shall I? Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh... Yeah, the, the word beautiful is in itself something we can <laughs> discuss. Uh, but uh, yeah, I hope so. I, I mean, what we are saying since the beginning of, of, of this uh, uh, lecture is, uh, is not about gear. So definitely, like I think uh, now we are at, uh, um, in, a, in a moment in history in which like uh, is, is not, everything is not more... I mean, it's more common to to find the musicians that are used to uh, every kind of instruments, you know, to work with every kind of instruments. Like, uh, I um, I think that uh, this uh, is also uh, um, we can see also this uh, in the revival of like uh, um, uh, technologies that uh, were uh, considered like uh, old uh, with the um, uh, when the computer era, let's say, started, and now they are back now. So there is a new inter interest uh, in uh, uh, modular synthesizer and uh, in tape. Uh, and so definitely I, I feel like my generation at least uh, is a, uh, it's a generation that is looking at uh, tools uh, very like we, we know bias somehow. Like uh, it's... Uh, like you, you have this, um, everyone, I mean, the majority of like uh, composers have this feeling that they can work with any kind of like uh, technology and every kind of like um, instruments. So the medium doesn't matter anymore. And, no. and um, we actually, well, we have a few minutes left. There was an, another uh, question from the audience. Um, it's actually, I'm, I don't know if there is actually a difference. The question was about um, the the differences we mentioned between uh, Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands. Um, in what sense is locality significant? And uh, you both lived in The Hague. Um, are there significant differences with uh, different cities in the Netherlands related to development of electronic music? But probably geog Graphically, within the Netherlands, probably there's not a lot of difference, right? I mean, the main cities in the Netherlands are so close to one another. I mean, it takes 20 minutes to go from Rotterdam to The Hague, uh, 40 minutes to go to Amsterdam. Uh, so I guess what we call the Randstad is basically one uh, one city, not, not geographically, but also uh, artistically, I would say. But there is something interesting about The Hague, uh, which is that it used to be uh, a rather boring city in the, in, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, with the exception maybe of the, uh, of the punk uh, movement. Um, uh, but there were hardly any bars, hardly any galleries, hardly any uh, concert venues. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, there is an in, in, a fantastic increase in not only... Uh, you know, large events uh, like uh, the Rewire Festival and so on. But there are also uh, a lot of small places, cafes, uh, galleries, uh, where um, uh, experimental music uh, plays an important role. There were, a few years ago, there was a big article in The Wire uh, about the, the Hague experimental music scene. And uh, it was very clear 
while reading that article that the uh, the students and the alumni of uh, uh, art science, uh, the composition department, and and scenology uh, played uh, played an important role in that uh, that development. Yeah, I can absolutely confirm because it, that's my experience in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, The Hague is a very special place for instrumental music uh, for experimental music. And uh, I have to say that um, uh, the special thing is that is an incredible supportive scene. So as a music musician, you feel that you can just try out and you can share ideas, uh, even if uh, they are an early stage of your research. Uh, and um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, the, it's, music it's mostly musician pl musicians playing for musicians. And uh, so there is a good side and bad side of this, uh, but for, uh, for growing as an artist and for uh, research and to, to experiment is, um, uh, in my experience, at least uh, is, uh, is an amazing place for, for this reason. And it's not only about um, the school. So yeah, uh, as the case was saying, like um, you have uh, the chance to present your work also in, a, in other kind of uh, environments and um, have feedback uh, about that. Uh, and of course, also big festivals are uh, play an important role, but uh, mm. the, you know. Okay, so there is some difference because The Hague is different. Um, and um, so we are out of time. And um, so maybe, uh, we, I think we talked about the history, we talked about today. Um, you can maybe finish with one more uh, idea about the future and then I think we're done if you have one. Otherwise, this is just the current times and that was it. Mm, yeah, well, about the future, I, was, I just have to say that I really hope that these uh, new um, problems that we are facing with the, the, uh, the yeah, for the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, uh, will open up also like new platforms, you know, for, uh, for making music and it will uh, also increase uh, um, a new, uh, new possibilities for, uh, yeah, mm, new ways of uh, uh, experiencing uh, sound. So like sound walks or like, uh, uh, there are s such a a different variety of uh, music performance that you can uh, um, uh, experience as an audience. And I, I really hope that the audience will, uh, uh, will be more conscious that uh, music is not just about being in a concert hall. I hope so too with the current times mm. in case. What I would like to say is that uh, it's maybe, I mean, we're talking about the history of electronic music, but there is almost no history yet. I mean, it's such an incredibly short development if you compare it to uh, the history of music. Um, so I think that we are not, uh, you know, at a point yet where we should talk about something as, I mean, there is of course, the tradition, something that we have to take into account when we want to make new music, but we are really at the beginning of something. And uh, just to quote uh, Gottfried Michael Koenig, every sound is a promise. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Case, and thank you, Laura from Italy. Um, I think we're, this is it. Thank you so much. And thank you thanks. very much. Thank you. <laughs>